Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Morsley Learning Events uh, inaugural webinar, Happy at Work. Uh, my name is Genevieve Glover. I'm Managing Director of Morsley Learning. A brief introduction on Morsley Learning. We are a startup community interest company with a strategic vision of raising knowledge and awareness of mental health and well-being through the production and delivery of world-class and accessible learning in mental health and well-being. We aim to do this in three ways. One is through our beautiful award-winning building, um, the Autus, based in Camberwell on the uh, Denmark Hill Morsley campus through Morsley Learning Events, this being the inaugural webinar, um, and also through Autos Online, which is our virtual learning environment that will go live in spring of next year. The Happy at Work webinar um, very much focuses on um, essentially fear of stigma, so looking at mental health in the workplace. And just to quote a Time to Change survey, uh, which is an anti-stigma program delivered by Mind and Rethink, 67% of people said that the fear of stigma had actually stopped them from telling an employer or prospective employer about a mental health problem. This webinar is specifically designed to help HR professionals understand the importance of communicating, communication in creating a happier and therefore more productive workplace. And to support um, us in this webinar, I'm very pleased to, to introduce three individuals um, who have a wide range of experience in this area. Um, speaking first is Dr. Jed Boardman, who is Senior Policy Advisor at the Centre for Mental Health and Consultant Psychiatrist and Senior Lecturer in Social Psychiatry at South London and Morsley Foundation Trust and the Institute of Psychiatry. Um, Jed has published widely on social and community psychiatry, and his research interests include the epidemiology of mental disorders, psychological disorders in general practice, evaluation of psychiatric services, recovery and employment. So welcome, Jed. We also joined by Barbara Wilson. Barbara founded Working with Cancer in 2005. She's also a senior HR professional with almost 40 years experience, based in a variety of businesses, including Catlin Group Limited, Schroeder's Investors Management, Barclays, and Price Waterhouse. Seven years ago, after being diagnosed with breast cancer, Barbara set up a group called Working with Cancer, with the aim of helping those of working age affected by cancer to return successfully to work. And our third and final speaker is Dr. Iria Badan, um, who is a consultant occupational physician at Guy's and St. Thomas's and has been chief medical advisor to the Houses of Parliament since 1999. She's worked as a senior policy advisor to the Department of Health and is currently a member of the Indu Industrial Injuries Advisory Council. She has a long-standing interest in the mental health at work and is an honorary senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry. Um, so welcome to all three of you and thank you for, for joining us for this inaugural webinar. Um, I'd like to uh, hand over to start off with to uh, Dr. Jed Boardman, who's going to talk to us about communication between worker, employer, and clinician. Jed. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, in my uh, brief talk, what I want to highlight is the importance of good communication in getting people with mental health problems into work, or back to work after a period of ill health, or indeed keeping them in work. Now, I'm sure we'll all agree there's sort of three key uh, groups of people that need to communicate together. And I think that's the workers themselves, employers, and clinicians. And it's that triangle of people that I want to concentrate on. The key message, I think, to all those uh, people is that um, good work is good for mental health. And I think we need, of course, to bear in mind that some working conditions can be very poor for people's mental health and well-being. The three, the sort of main key areas I just want to talk about today uh, are supporting people at work with a history of mental health problems and helping people return to work after a period of ill health. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of what I'll say, once I'll focus on people with mental health problems will also be sort of generalizable to many other groups of people who suffer uh, ill health at work. Um, so work is good for mental health. Yes, I think work, whether paid or unpaid, is of course an important part of life. And studies show that work is generally good for mental health. Of course, as, as well as a financial reward, work gives many of us self-esteem, companionship, status, sense of identity, and personal achievement. And, and remember also the, 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 the corollary of this, unemployment or worklessness, is certainly bad for your health. 
And returning to work after a period of illness, including mental ill health, can help recovery and can help prevent long-term sickness. So in a sense, the message for workers is that work can help you get better and stay better. Now, for employers, of course, I think we'd all agree that people are their greatest assets. You know, it's, it's healthy people who make a positive impact on productivity and effectiveness of businesses. But also, work can play an important role in supporting the health and well-being of employers. And remember, of course, that mental health problems at work can be costly, both in terms of absenteeism and presenteeism. So perhaps the message for employers is, you know, your workers will be the most productive in the workplace, in any workplace, that supports good mental health. Now, for clinicians, work, they, I think people, clinicians have to realize, I think, that work is an important part of a person's recovery. You know, the longer the person is off work with mental health problems, the less likely they are to return to work. So in some degree, the relationship between clinician and patient is, is controlling as to whether those people will actually ever get back to work. And rates of worklessness, of course, in some people with mental health problems, particularly those with severe mental health problems, is particularly low. In schizophrenia, it's probably about 10% of people who work. And of course, unemployment it generally is a sort of important factor in what we might call social exclusion. So for clinicians, the key message is working, for most patients, is a positive clinical outcome and can be an intervention in its own right. So how can these, given, given those messages to each of those three groups, how can we sort of start working together uh, to help people get back to work and stay in work? So um, I've chosen a few areas here that might be important. I'm sure there are many others, but I've not got time to discuss them today. Um, now thinking, one thing is of course important to people is managing how personal information is shared between healthcare professionals, employers, and employees. And we know that the stigma and misconceptions about mental ill health mean that many workers find it difficult to talk about their mental health problems and will, of course, avoid often talking about it because of fear of losing their job. So it's important to have the right health and well-being policies in place during the recruitment process and afterwards. Ideally, what we need in workplaces is a culture in that organization where everybody is treated with respect and where honest communication is encouraged. And remember, sometimes difficult conversations are necessary. And line managers, who I think are key to this process, may need training how best to handle uh, those people with mental health problems and other disorders in the workplace. Um, for workers, it's important that they consider what, of course, and how they wish to disclose their disorders, their problems, to employers. And I think clinicians in this area need to be aware of the Equality Act in terms of information sharing and also the sort of need for uh, advice on reasonable adjustments. Now, other things we might consider are working between GPs, occupational physicians, and specialist mental health services. In terms of the key clinical groups, those are perhaps the most important three uh, groups to, to serve people with mental health problems. Um, and the key activities that, that health and care professionals can support employers and workers with are really things like assessing the risks of a particular workplace or a specific person in that workplace, uh, developing what and putting in place what might be reasonable adjustments, and advising employers and employees on the effect of medication on carrying out tasks at work. We also note the government brought in the new FIT note, which has, I think, the potential to aid communication. It, it's what we used to call the sick note. Because this can provide a way of giving just more information than uh, whether a person is fit or not fit for work. It can allow for statements about a phased or gradual return to work, as well as the need to make reasonable adjustments. And in this way, I think it can facilitate discussion between 
doctor and patient about how and when to return to work. Importantly, and I stress this, what you're after as a clinician is working with the patient to actually give them the requisite treatment for their disorder, but also early on and in parallel to that, talking about getting back to work. Because de getting, delaying in getting back to work is just one way of ensuring that people may never return to work. There is, of course, the uh, uh, notion of report writing and supporting somehow good communication between health professionals, employer and employees. Now, we know, I think, that requesting reports from GPs and, uh, and mental health professionals and writing reports for occupational health can be difficult. And often, it, they're regarded as a very poor process. Now, I'm not going to go into the sort of the details of report writing today, but I can say that on the uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists website, there are some helpful pointers uh, on sharing information between occupational health staff, mental health professionals, and employers, which people might wish to uh, look at. And I'll give you the web link later. Uh, we also need to con concern ourselves with the support needed to sustain a job. Because, of course, once a person with mental health problems has got a job or they've got back to work, they're faced with returning to that job and somehow flourishing it. So they may need different amounts of support. Remember, some may require no support, but others may require a lot more. Others may just re require the implementation of, say, reasonable adjustments. And you, it cannot be automatically assumed that those who need little or no additional support to get a job will also need little support to keep in it. Also, of course, the opposite is true. Those who need much support to get a job, you might find, actually, they need less support when they're in the job. And, of course, people need support in, say, the job search, you know, liaison with Job Centre Plus, development of action plans, writing CVs. Uh, they may need assistance in transition to work, you know, to help them think about reorganizing their life around work. Or they may need ongoing support when they're in work, particularly managing fluctuations in their conditions. Um, finally, I want to turn to just to briefly to returning to work after a period of uh, ill health. Now, returning to work after a period of Ill, mental ill health, or indeed any form of ill health, can be often be daunting. Now, how can we help with this? Well, firstly, I think it's important to consider that people during their sickness absence need to keep in contact with their workplace, particularly their, their uh, HR departments and their line managers. And it can be helpful for people to keep in contact with their employers. But some managers, as well as workers, uh, worry that such contact during a period of sick leave can be seen, of course, as harassment. Uh, workers may be encouraged, of course, to take the lead in contacting their manager. Probably a good idea. They, they can also then agree what form of contact that should take and how often it will take place. And cut down some of those rather uh, uh, those barriers that prevent them doing that for reasons of feeling embarrassed, and also I think for managers perhaps feeling that they're taking over that process. We also need to think, and it may, some of you may not know this, but there's a good idea is to try and develop a sort of wellness and recovery action plan for individuals, uh, and this is one approach to managing a fluctuating health condition is to for pe ask people to develop their own personal uh, recovery plans. In, and that would ask a, and think, allow them to think about how they can keep well at work, how they can identify signs or triggers of ill health, what to do in a crisis, and how to get back on track after a crisis. Remember, those are personal plans for those individuals. They're not plans made by the clinicians. I think the other thing is to think about preparing uh, and planning for an employee's return to work. And that needs to be done starting at an early stage. For example, are there any factors that might have caused the person to go off work? What adjustments might be needed to help them get back into work? And of course, that's where people, the uh, employer may need to seek advice from their occupational health advisor. But overall, I think here, a culture of open and honest communication will help facilitate those sorts of disclosure and discussions, especially to emphasize the importance, I think, here of working in partnership 
between those three groups I identified at the beginning of the talk. Now, I think I've covered probably enough there, and I'll just leave you with the uh, website address uh, for the uh, work and mental health uh, pages on the Royal College of Web Royal College of Psychiatrists website. What you'll find in there is much of what I've uh, given you this morning, plus a lot more and a lot of links to other uh, organisations that provide some very good advice. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jed. Um, that was uh, quite a helpful uh, quick run through of. Um, communication between worker, employer, and clinician. And just to, to let all those that are, that are listening in, um, we have about sort of 20 seconds to let you think of some incisive questions for me to ask Jed on your behalf. So do uh, put those into the, to the chat, and we can pick those up. Um, as I started to for 10, from, from my perspective, um, Jed, you mentioned about the communication, um, particularly between the perhaps HR professional, the line manager, and the worker. Um, and how that can support their absence, but also their return to work. What would you be your sort of further comments in terms of communication with the workers, team, and colleagues, um, both in their absence, but also for their return to work as well? Well, I think I think that's very can be slightly tricky that because of course I I think there's a, a whole lot of difference between communicating your private information to your uh, employers or through your doctor or the uh, occupational health departments and communicating that with the people you work with. And I think mm -hmm. that has to be left to a very personal view by the uh, worker themselves. Um, you, I, you can't, um, you, I cannot give generalized advice sure. about that and I don't think anybody can. It's a matter of how people feel comfortable disclosing that to other individuals, um, it's how they feel comfortable working with other individuals who know some of their private lives. Now, that's the same for all of us. But I think what I'm talking about here is, is, is providing communication which must be regarded as essentially confidential. And the issues of providing, if you like, what, what that worker might say to their colleagues is really going to have to be left up to them. But of course, that's why one would encourage the sort of, if you like, the culture in an organization to be as open as possible and as supportive as possible to those individuals. So, so very much as you say, that sort of culturally, it's about um, sort of positive reinforcement um, and support for mental health and well-being of the workforce. They're sort of um, the best practice framework to work within. But as you say, with each individual, it's quite a bespoke um, situation as to how they would like it to be handled, both with their line manager, their HR professionals, and their colleagues as well. And I'm sure that's something that Barbara might touch on um, when she talks next. Um, we've had a further question um, that has come through, which is really uh, the sort of beginning and end of the role that clinician clinicians play in the process of employers providing a supportive environment? What role can clinicians play with, with organizations in providing that supportive culture? I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether Dr. Maiden might answer that question better than I was from mm -hmm. her position as an occupational um, health physician. But I, I, I'm a secondary care physician, and I would suggest that I, I'll just take that question a stage back. Because I think one of the big issues for, um, for, uh, for, for health staff is they often communicate to their patients about the impossibility of going back to work. And I think uh, that's often been a reported by service users that they'll say, well, they told me I'd never work again, or it was going to be very difficult to get back to work. Now, I think that's where I take my own starting point, that actually, you know, as a, as a uh, physician, I need to sort of be a sort of holder of hope for that person, that we need to start providing a more hopeful message, uh, of, of a realistically hopeful message about how they might return to work, and providing them through, um, through their treatment and through the, the, the encouragement uh, of, of thinking about how to plan to return to work. Um, and that's, I think, the sort of way in which I, I would see myself as a as a secondary care physician. And I think GPs are in exactly the same situation. We have to provide, I think, the realistic hope for people that it can happen. There's no reason that it can't. Provided that person wants to go into work, provided they want to return to work, that's that's what you need. 
the rest of it is providing the support and, and, and right environment for the room to return to. Just a question. Oh, yep. Apologies. I think you lost me there for a moment. Um, just to, we've had a question through from Sally asking whether it's possible to have a slide copy of the presentation, and that's absolutely fine. Everybody who's dialing in will make sure that's sent through with the links that uh, Jed and the others will, will be including. Um, I would encourage you all to send your questions through so we can make the most of the expertise we have uh, around the table. Uh, um, just, just a further question from me. Um, in terms of sort of mental health and well-being initiatives that are being implemented in the workplace, um, I'd be interested to know, Jed, from your perspective, and then it's, it's perhaps also a question for Barbara and Ira, is, is what sort of best practice um, you have come across uh, in terms of how they are communicated across the business to reinforce a culture and to increase take up and the likelihood of, of people to feel that there isn't a stigma associated with mental health in the workplace? Well, I think... I think there are two issues here. What one I think you, you can many larger businesses are, are in a much better position to provide. I think um, occupation. Apologies, we are just uh, reconnecting Jed, and he will recap on uh, his response to, to my question regarding best practice in communication within a corporate environment to reinforce a positive culture. Yep, we're back online. Back over to you, Jed. I'm reconnecting. Yep, you're reconnecting. Thank you. <laughs> um, <coughs> Where was I at there? I'm really it's really worth, just to, to re reinforce the question, the question, recap, absolutely. So the, so the question was really um, what best practice you've come across um, in terms of communicating mental health and wellbeing initiatives uh, within an organization to not only reinforce that positive and supportive culture, but also ensure that there's take up um, and engagement with those initiatives from staff. Uh, I think what I, what I was started to say was um, for, for many larger uh, business concerns from larger organizations, they often have much better uh, policies and much better uh, 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 occupational health um, input into their organizations. A lot of the smaller and medium-sized businesses really have problems with that and the quality of, um, uh, of their occupational uh, health uh, support. But of course, there's no reason why those smaller businesses shouldn't actually um, uh, provide decent support to, to, to their staff. Indeed, in, in many ways, they're in an ideal position in smaller organizations. I would um, perhaps just highlight here one thing, though, that uh, one, of the import, uh, one of the clearly important people in, in, in an organization are the line managers. And they do need, I think, themselves support to provide support mm -hmm. for their uh, for the employees in that organization. Um, I'm not talking about them being counselors, but I am talking about them being aware of mental health problems within the workforce, uh, picking that up within, their, uh, within, within the people that they manage, and um, managing, uh, helping people manage those, um, those uh, mental health problems within that workforce. I think they're, they're, they're a very um, important channel, I think, for providing support for people. If they're unwell at work, they need to go off work and they want to get back to work. Fantastic. And in fact, th there are some good schemes now in providing training for line managers. Uh, the Centre for Mental Health certainly provides that sort of training. That's great. Lovely. Thank you for that, Jed. Right. We are moving on to our next speaker. Um, welcome to Barbara Wilson, who's a strategic HR consultant and founder of Working With Cancer. And she's talking us through the hidden impact of cancer. Over to you, Barbara. Um, well, today's focus uh, is on mental health. And you might well say, what has that 
got to do with cancer and returning to work. And uh, my response to that is a great deal to do with cancer, as uh, I hope you'll see uh, from my presentation, which uh, is just coming up now on the screen. So let me first of all start by just giving you um, some, some statistics. Uh, and you, you're probably aware of these statistics already, uh, and most, if not all of us, will already know someone uh, who, has ha who has or has had cancer. Um, something like over 700,000 people of working age, that's between the ages of 16 and 64, are living with cancer in the UK. It's about half a million actually known to be currently working, which is about 1.5% of the current working population. Something like over 500,000 carers for people with cancer are estimated to be working full or part-time. What you probably wouldn't be aware of is that something like over 80% of those who are working when diagnosed with cancer think it's important to continue to work, but almost 60% had to give up work or change their roles as a result of their diagnosis. Um, and the cost to the economy, actually, of that is something like over £6 billion. Pounds. That's a hell of a lot in terms of lost productivity for the country. These numbers are actually likely to double over the next 10 to 15 years. But the, the really important thing to bear in mind is that work is very rarely the cause of an individual having cancer. And in fact, there's increasing evidence that it can significantly, returning to work, working can significantly aid recovery. And that's very much in line with uh, what um, Dr. Jed Boardman was just saying. Work can be extremely beneficial. So just moving on, when people think about the side effects of cancer, and there are many and various, they tend to focus on those the physical impact rather than the psychological impact of what's happened. What's happened. Actually, some side effects can actually begin after treatment has finished, which not many people are aware of. But some of the psychological effects are depression, lack of confidence, uh, general anxiety about returning to work, and something that's these days called chemo brain cognitive problems, people finding that their thinking processes have slowed down. Um, so these are some of the things uh, that uh, can affect people as a consequence of, of having had cancer. And what I'd just like to talk about is the is sort of impact of that and what that really means in, in practical terms. because. As I said, work offers an important lifeline back to normality and well-being. But many cancer survivors talk about feeling abandoned after their treatment. Uh, they particularly fear recurrence. Every, every ache, every pain, every twinge causes anxiety. People feel insecure. They've lost their sense of being invulnerable. Now, this actually happens to many people who have um, a chronic illness or what could be a, a life-threatening illness. So people, coronary patients, people with uh, other serious illnesses like diabetes or Parkinson's. But I think it's, it's very much the case that people as they tend to focus on the physical aspect of cancer rather than the psychological. And I'm afraid to say clinicians and employers also tend to focus on physical recovery. Um, and one other issue is that very often cancer survivors are unwilling to admit or to discuss any of these issues for fear of the consequences of work, for fear that people will think, will think badly of them. And as again, as my colleague has just said, communication, as well as knowledge and understanding of what's happening, are absolutely key to making a successful return to work. My next slide, I've just got a couple of quotes, uh, real quotes, not made up ones, which show you some of the things that people have been thinking about when they're returning to work. Constantly worried that cancer might return, but I didn't know who to discuss it with. And in any event, everyone was telling me I should be happy that I was in remission and back at work. So this is a case where 
everyone was saying, well, you should be really happy that you're in remission. But they were actually feeling guilty. They weren't feeling happy. So they were actually locked into a kind of vicious circle. The second quote is something that was told to me by an individual I was coaching to help them return to work after having had thyroid cancer. They had gone back to work at a, a school there with a head teacher there and suddenly were hit by depression and loss of confidence, uh, having nightmares that the doctor had only given him one year to live because his cancer had returned, was worried about what to say to his staff and to the children and to the governors and the whole thing was then capped by having a poor Ofsted report. I spent four or five sessions working closely with that individual, basically talking about life and priorities and understanding that cancer doesn't make you any less of an individual. It just gives you experiences to draw upon and build upon as life continues. And that individual returned very successfully to work and uh, had an Ofsted rating about a year later where the school was rated as outstanding. So I believe that kind of one-to-one -one support helped that individual make a successful return to work because he was able to confront his fears and his nightmares and then go back to work, which gave him a new lease of life. It gave him that confidence, financial independence, structure, independence, the things, again, that Jed referred to earlier. Moving on, some, some good news in a way. Uh, these issues are increasingly being discussed uh, uh, at large. Um, Oxford Economics published a report in November last year where they talked about these kinds of issues and they made three very important recommendations. Uh, one, that businesses should take a more rounded and long-term approach to people affected by cancer. That they needed to provide education and guidance and training to all levels of employee about what to expect from someone returning to work after cancer. And last but not least, that businesses should appoint a coach or a mentor or a third party to help facilitate communication between employers and employees. That's really important. I think one of the issues at the moment is many organizations don't have access to occupational health. And sometimes EAP programs or occupational health programs tend to focus very much on the physical aspects of returning to work rather than just the other issues that people are, are having to confront. Sometimes people don't trust, I'm afraid to say, they don't trust their HR function or they don't trust OH. And sometimes having an independent intermediary can be really helpful and really beneficial. And that, that person would work with occupational health or an EAP program, but just adds an in, a level of independence and a level of trust that might not be there. So I just wanted to focus finally on some of the work that I do and the services I provide. I, I work quite closely with Macmillan Cancer Support, but I've now, over the last few months, set up my own organization to work with people affected by cancer. The services I provide are training and education for line managers. And I'd just like to focus on that for a moment. I believe line managers are the most, play the most critical role in helping people return to work. The first reaction of a line manager can make all the difference to whether someone will make a successful return. So I believe that training and education for them, HR professionals and clinicians on the psychological as well as, as, well as the physical challenges can, can make a real difference. And, and the work I do would cover the challenges faced by those working, uh, wanting to return to work after cancer, the resources available to support them, and then how to support a successful return. And that would cover everything from those first conversations, which are so critical and so important to get right, through to some of the legal issues that need to be understood, how to, how to make reasonable adjustments, and then how to keep in touch once somebody has made their return to work. 
The other services are coaching, which I've just mentioned, one-to-one -one support for, indiv for individual employees, but also for, for wives and families, and also for line managers if they would like to take part. And then finally, looking at employment policies uh, that people have for managing chronic long-term conditions. Uh, things like setting up buddying schemes, for example, so that individuals can develop their own support networks. So these are all simple but practical things that people can put in place. And I'd just like to, to leave you by, by saying one thing. Helping people return to work who've had a cancer diagnosis, who've actually got any form of chronic long-term condition, can be very simple. It needs time. It needs a little bit of thought. It needs sometimes a bit of imagination. It needs good communication. That's actually not difficult once you give it some thought and a little bit of knowledge and understanding. And if, as we now know, that enabling people to return to work, which can aid recovery, is what this leads to, then surely it has to be worth doing it for all of our sakes. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Barbara. Um, as I've mentioned previously, uh, I will be allowing sort of 20 seconds to allow people to uh, to send their questions through for Barbara, uh, and it may be that we capture those at the end as well. I mean, just a couple of questions um, from myself, Barbara. I mean, obviously, you've you've had a variety of roles over the last sort of 40 years uh, as a sort of strategic HR professional in a variety of different businesses, and then more recently um, with your organisation working with cancer. For the, the individuals that we have uh, listening in who are uh, mostly HR professionals um, in a variety of businesses, some larger, some smaller, what sort of quick wins do you think there might be, um, you know, perhaps while they're having conversations um, behind the scenes at a strategic level about um, a shift in, in how um, working with cancer is approached or mental health issues approach, what sort of quick wins that they might be able to apply tomorrow or Monday um, that they could take away from this webinar? Um, I think um, one quick win might be to either go to my website or the Macmillan website and just see the kind of things that you can quickly put in place as an employer. Links to websites, for example, which have lots of information. Um, I think um, it, it's sometimes quite difficult to, to know where to start. Maybe a conversation with the, senior, with the senior team, with the chief executive, just to get their sense of what they think is important, what their policy would be on working cancer. Yes. Because sometimes as HR professionals, we worry that we can't do the right thing because the boss, whoever it is, wouldn't like it. And actually, if we were only to talk to them about this, we might find out actually, well, they would be really supportive of doing more than, than the organization currently does. So I think have a look at the websites because there's lots and lots of information there. You might be able to put some links on the intranet. Sure. But maybe just talk to some senior people and get their views quickly and get their sense of how much more you could do. I'm sure many of those people would be very supportive. Excellent. Thank you, Barbara. So we're moving on to our third and, and final speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ira Madan, who is consultant and honorary senior lecturer in occupational health medicine, guys in St. Thomas's, and also at King's College London. And Ira is going to be talking through accessing occupational health services, the new health and work services. Um, so actually, she's not doing a presentation. My apologies. Um, I've actually, we're actually going to do some sort of question and answers that we've um, prepared in advance, really, just to, uh, to pick Ira's brains uh, and then open it out to the participants to see whether they had any other questions that they'd like to, to ask. So uh, Ira, welcome. Hey, thank you. Pleasure. So just to, just to start off with, I mean, it, it actually links um, quite well with the conversation um, and the presentation from Barbara. I mean, how, how can an employer access occupational health services to support themselves as a business, but also um, their teams? Yeah, well, there, there are several ways. Um, first of all, some of the big organizations have in-house occupational health services, uh, and that's fantastic, but we recognize, and the Department of Health over many years has recognized that um, small to medium sized industries and enterprises have difficulty in accessing um, good quality occupational health services and they don't know where to look. So they, they set up a few years ago, they set up a, a health for work advice line for small businesses, um, which has got its own website. There's a free phone number. There's a lot of information on there. 
um, and it's definitely worth um, those attendees who work for small to medium enterprises who, who'd like to have a look at that that website. Um, there's also a possibility that your, your local NHS trust may have in-house occupational health services that will also provide advice to external um, organisations. Now, unfortunately, occupational health wasn't included in the NHS at its, in, at its uh, inception in 1948. So. Um, Trusts do charge for these services, but they're um, they're, they're not usually not expensive, and you can sometimes get informal advice. But uh, formal advice is um, available at some trusts as well. And then finally, a really exciting initiative is being put forward by the the DWP. It's been accepted by the government that there is a need for a health and work service for individuals who have been off work. For more than four weeks, and it's going to start in um, April 2015. There's some pilots in 2014, but this will be available for employers and for GPs and for individuals. So it's a very exciting initiative. Fantastic, thank you. And it's, we've talked. I mean, the theme for, for the webinar is obviously communication, and, and Jed started us off looking at communication between the worker, employee, the employer, and the clinician. I mean, when do you think it is useful for an employer to actually engage the input of an occupational health service? Yeah, I mean, ideally, I work in an in-house service at, at the Houses of Parliament, and um, ideally, we like to see people when they've been off work for ten days. If people have been off work for less than 10 days, and the, the evidence is very clear that they're likely to come back to work. Um, but after between 10 days and four weeks is a high risk period, really, and that's where you can really intervene effectively. It doesn't have to be, a, certainly I don't see people as the consultant, I don't see people at 10 days, very rarely. But we've got case managers, we've got um, occupational health nurses who will intervene at that stage just to communicate with the the individual check if their um, if their social reasons why they might not be coming back to work if their work issues that perhaps just some minor adjustments might help the individual and and really just to encourage everybody to start talking about um, a return to work program after four weeks they should definitely be be um, seen and, and assessed really because that's when you start to get to the high risk of, of individuals not coming back to work. Once you get to 28 weeks of somebody being off work, the chances of them returning are, are less than 10%. Um, and the reasons for that are um, usually um, psychological and social rather than the underlying condition. So early intervention is important. Yeah. And then for those who don't have experience of engaging with an occupational um, professional, what can they as an employer expect in terms of process, but also what can the employee expect as well? Yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, Barbara and um, Jed both referred to training of, of line managers and, um, and HR as well. I, line managers, I concur exactly what the previous speakers have said and my colleagues have said about um, line managers being key. Um, they need to be trained in, they don't have to be trained in, in, in occupational health practice, but they just need to be trained in, in the importance of, of um, communication with the worker. And as Barbara said, it's that first approach that's really important, that first reaction. Um, and it's a very fine line between uh, managers trying to, to inter, interfere or as employees perceiving that they that managers are interfering and pressing them to come back to work and and, and, and man, rather than managers being seen as supportive and we actually teach all our um, line managers in what's called mental health first aid and just mental health awareness so that so it's really being very clear between you don't need the managers don't need to know the detail of a medical condition but they need to know how to support the employer without the employee sorry, the employee, without the employee or the worker feeling that they're being forced to come back to work. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that uh, Jed mentioned earlier when he was speaking was around reasonable adjustments. I and mean, could you sort of explain, I suppose, what a reasonable adjustment might be, but also where that fits within the legislation supporting uh, sort of mental health, um, specifically the Equality Act? 
Yeah, so um, under the Equality Act, uh, an individual is considered disabled if they have a condition which lasts for more than 12 months, which is interfering with their day-to-day -day activity, and that includes going to work. So individuals would be covered by the Equality Act um, in those circumstances. But to be honest, the, the Equality Act is really just about good practice, and I, I strongly encourage any, any employees, um, sorry, any employers, um, to provide reasonable adjustments for individuals with both physical and mental health problems. It's good for business, it gets people back to work, you don't want to lose your valuable employee who you've, you've trained up for all for, for years. Um, and the type of adjustments we use, particularly for mental health conditions, we talk, um, sorry, we, uh, it's particularly around medication and that's quite a common one, so individuals may be on uh, medication which makes them feel sleepy in the morning or if it makes them feel a bit more sleepy in the afternoon so we quite often have late people coming in just a little bit later they can they can work later or there could be some flexible working where they can work at home we also take into consideration poor quality of sleep which is very common in people with mental health problems and again that that has a huge impact on on work and concentration levels, particularly those with um, anxiety and depression, which are very common. Um, we give adjustments on a temporary basis, perhaps, while somebody's just going through the treatment phase, so maybe letting them have one day less at work or having shortened hours. Um, we also ask people in, in depth about, as, as an occupational health practitioner, I'd, I'd ask people in depth about their memory and ability with figures, because that commonly goes with uh, individuals with, with depression and anxiety. And we could feed that back to the manager, and that might be a temporary adjustment. Um, also, face-to-face -face contact as well, maybe sometimes quite hard. So we temporarily say move somebody from a post that has where they have face-to-face -face contact with the public, say in the house, to a to a more of a back role, just while they're in a recovery period. Yeah, I mean one of the um, areas that Barbara picked on was uh, was really ensuring that uh, people have access to um, to health and support, health help and support, um, and further information. I mean, from your experience, what role can line managers play in ensuring that um, workers have access to mental health professionals and actually do access that help that's being provided? Again, I mean, normally this would go through the through an occupational health department. I think it's quite difficult for line managers um, to do that on on their own, to, and they really do need to seek some other advice. I mean, what we would do if we were asked by a line manager to say, for instance, somebody with um, depression was back at work, and they the line manager was really concerned that that individual wasn't taking their medication, or they seemed to not be functioning well at work we might see them and um, uh, we'd do an assessment to see whether they were seeing their GP, whether they were taking the medication, whether they had been under the community mental health team if it's a, a severe condition. So really I think that does need to go um, through an OH professional and that was one of the one of the indications I'd say for managers to actually actually seek professional help from, from an occupational health department. Yeah. I mean, we've we've talked about um, sort of longer term mental and and physical health conditions as well. I mean, do you find that there is a a seasonality almost um, in some of the uh, particularly the mental health issues that are presenting themselves? I'm mindful of the fact that we're early December, so entering the the festive season. Is is there something in particular that again there can be some sort of takeaways for the HR professionals and others that are dialing into this webinar? Yeah, um, it, alcohol has got to be the big one, big one for Christmas. Um, but as far as depression and anxiety are concerned, which are the common things that we see, I, I, I don't think there is a difference. I mean, supposedly there is people get worse in the winter, and people quite often don't feel quite so good during the winter. But I, I can't say that I see a seasonality particularly. But alcohol definitely is something to look out for um, at this time of year. Um, and we'd really go along prevention here. I mean, we haven't talked too much about prevention in this seminar, but that's the, the big thing um, Jed touched on it, I think, to say, well, actually, we've got a, 
employers have a big role in preventing mental ill health. So an alcohol policy, um, just to think really carefully about it. You know, if you're having a business, if you're having a, a an office party, if the alcohol is supplied by the employer, then actually you're responsible for your employees getting home safely. <laughs> um, and you need to just think about the the pros and cons of of having a, an event with a lot of alcohol being served um but more generally on, on the preventative side i think um having a good um stress management policies and having getting feedback from your employers via staff, staff surveys um or if it's a small organization i see some of the attendees are from small organizations that uh, actually you, you get a feedback about um about the mental health of, of people at work. You, you tend to know in a small organisation whether whether individuals are happy at work if they feel that they've got organisational um, justice at work. And that's quite a big thing that people feel, particularly around this time of year when they're talking about pay and um, thinking about their rewards. Um, and it, uh, I, I really do think that's something that HR and um, line managers can... Um, contribute a lot to is, is the prevention of mental health at, at work. Excellent, thank you. And just a, a question that's come through from, from our uh, participants is really around reasonable adjustments for carers. So we've, we've talked about those who may be suffering from mental health issues. Where do, where do reasonable adjustments for carers fit into this and what's the occupational health perspective? Uh, yeah, that's not, that's not so easy. There's certainly no legal framework to um, um, to protect carers, I fully support um, that there should be reasonable adjustments, but reasonable adjustments is a legal term, so this is for employers, they have to, if somebody, if they're advised on an adjustment, it's up to the employer to decide whether that's reasonable. So for instance, if I, I advise the, the House of Parliament that somebody needs an adjustment at their workplace, they can decide, is this reasonable or not, and that's a legal term. So they may say, no, this is not possible, um, it's not reasonable, it's not operationally reasonable for, for our business. And they have to just feel that they can justify that in, in a court. So that's where the term reasonable adjustments comes from. So it doesn't really apply to carers, I'm afraid. Sure, sure. I suppose it also sort of fits into something that we've touched on quite a bit through the webinar is really the culture um, of support and empathy for em for employees. I know that Barbara um, actually had something to to add in that particular question, so they're just making sure that we can hear her, and then I shall pass that uh, that question on. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, Barbara, just on to you. I was only going to say that um, yeah, that the the you can as a carer you can. Uh, request flexible working but the employer is not um, obliged to provide it you are allowed um, some compassionate leave unpaid compassionate leave uh, and, and many organizations will provide a little uh, and so some organizations for example might provide five days paid or sometimes often unpaid leave which of course the individual can take a little of half dose, but that that's about it. There, at the moment, it's down to the employer to take a view. Very few organisations actually have a carers policy. Full stop. And it's, a, it's a shame, isn't it? I, mean, I think it is a, something that perhaps could be lobbied for in the future. 